In the heart of every soul breathes a passion, a vision sometimes silenced by the routine of everyday life. Yet there are those among us who refuse to tiptoe around unawakened dreams. They are the courageous ones who dare to challenge boundaries and unleash their untamed spirits. Their inspired lives remind us when we unite our talents and visions with determination and perseverance, we are destined for greatness. We celebrate these individuals and invite you to awaken your dreams, for we have all been called to greatness. I'm Tracy Rosenfield. Join us as we travel the globe in pursuit of passion. What I found about life is that many people have great ambitions, right? And they said, this is what I'd like to be. I'd like to be a fighter pilot, or I'd like to be whatever it is. And, and the sad thing is, for whatever reasons, their job, they've been there a long time, they just don't go out and do it. And I have a, I, I really try to live my life that if I want to do something, I go and do it. And I always say to myself that, you know, life is not a dress rehearsal. I will go to the most dangerous place on earth, create logistics, build a ship, a camp or a lodge, take people there safely, have ultimate comforts at night, and have the best guides in the world, and show them something. They say, wow, was that impressive. Some believe lightning will strike when opposing forces come together under unique sets of circumstances. Such have been the eclectic journeys of Jeffrey Kent, a Kenyan cowboy who has embraced life's exploits and later became an impassioned global entrepreneur and philanthropic maverick. His days were of colonial Africa. Tea parties at the Muthaiga Country Club in Nairobi, an outpost that attracted such characters as Colonel Grogan and the legendary Lord Delamere. And yet, as a young boy at his family's farm on the Aberdare Highlands of Kenya, Geoffrey Kent's days were spent quite differently. Raised barefoot hunting wild animals, Jeffrey and his friends shared days of mischief under the blanket of stars that stretches across the African sky. My mother would walk the farm you know, with a pistol uh, strapped to her belt and I'd sort of walk behind and um, of course I had my horses there and we had a trout stream that went through, went through the farm. But it was really magical. I learned how to drive the Land Rover, age six. They used to put sort of pillows behind me and I drive this Land Rover all over the Kinnegal. It's such fun, really wonderful. Jeffrey's untamed youth provided him with life lessons most of us only read about in stories such as Robinson Crusoe. 
fluent in Swahili, Jeffrey rode motorcycles and hunted crocodiles at the young age of 13. By 16, Jeffrey knew it was time to embark on a walkabout, a solo expedition that took him on a two-month trek, which challenged him and pushed the limits of his journey toward adulthood. Armed with nothing but a shell oil map and a sleeping bag, Kent set out on his motorcycle with wild abandon. With a pistol at his side and a pocket full of biltong, Jeffrey Kent became the first motorcyclist to travel the often treacherous 5,000 miles spanning the African continent, from Kenya to Cape Town. For Kent, Africa is not just a place to live, it is life itself. Having thrived as a child on the plains of Kenya, and later as a young man with Sandhurst military experience, Jeffrey Kent was also recognized as a world's leading polo player. There's no wonder Jeffrey Kent's bountiful life story has served as a rock-solid foundation for him to pursue his passions, quite literally, to the ends of the earth. A life riddled with adventure, adversity, challenges, and success has transformed this Kenyan cowboy into the world's most celebrated luxury travel legend. This is his story. This is his Africa. This is Sai Africa. When I had a letter from my father, actually something rather dreadful had happened, that uh, Kenya had got independence in 1963, all of our farms had been taken over in 1962, and bottom line is, you're on your own. Enjoy it, you're educated, off you go. I said, no, I don't want to go, off you go. But every now and again there comes a defining moment where a man has to face up to his responsibilities and he's on his own. He gets with it or falls by the wayside, one of the two. I went back to Kenya and um, started around Abercrombie and Kent with my parents. And it was a, that was a big change too because uh, you had to, it was business, money. Actually, I hadn't had much to do with money until this time. It was all, it was activity and adventure and excitement. But suddenly there was, there was a bill to pay and there were wages to meet. And I sort of, you know, I had to balance my checkbook. And it was, that was a whole different life too. Abercrombie and Kent was really the first company to do mobile tent safaris in East Africa. But in the early days, the difficult thing was, and a lot of people ask me this, they say, well, how did you get your first clients? I mean, all of us have this dream, but where where'd you get the, the first people? You know, not easy. I used to sit outside the uh, New Stanley Hotel, which was the major hotel in Nairobi those days, waiting for what I thought was a wealthy person to arrive. And I would literally go up to them and say, um, maybe you're doing business in Nairobi, but uh, how about spending a few days on safari? And it's amazingly enough, many said yes. And that's where I started with my clients. They became close friends, and then they invited me to the United States. And so I started to get a clientele. Basically, I was their professional guy. Then, as time went on, I said, you know what? We were operating in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. I said, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be good to start to operate in other areas of Africa? So I got him, when, when it was off-season in the rainy period, I'd get in my Toyota, and off I'd go. And I drove all the way down to 
uh, in those days Rhodesia and Bechuana land, which is today Botswana, and Rhodesia is of course Zimbabwe. And this opened up a whole new one. This is wonderful. I came to the Zambezi, you know, we're sitting here now, and, and um, oh, this is these beautiful places. Well, you know, I've got to open up Abercrombie Kent here. So I find a really cool guy. I said, hey, how would you like to run Abercrombie Kent in Rhodesia? And he'd say, fine. And so I, I'd hire them, and, and we'd go. We'd form a 100 pound company, buy a Land Rover, and off we'd go. I used to take out great leaders of industry. I took out David Rockefeller, and, and you'd be with him, and you'd learn so much from him and all the philanthropic work that he was doing. And, and so you actually had these teachers, if you cared to listen, and I did. I was such a young person, and yet people like David Rockefeller and George S. Moore of Citibank and Mr. Farstone and all these others, iconic businessmen, you'd be with them for 30 days, and you were the leader. And then I suddenly realized, what was I doing? Why, why would they come all this way to Africa? Year after year, by the way, not just once. And then I realized, you know what I'm doing? I'm changing people's lives. And so, so I, I think I began to create a, a brand without even knowing it, which is actually to take people into the wilderness in absolute comfort and then give them an experience par excellence, which I did naturally because I'd grown up here in Africa. And that thrilled people. So I suddenly said, you know what, our brand has to be around all the places everyone would like to see, but is not brave enough to see on their own. As I started to develop, you know, these great adventures and these camps and these lodges, and indeed the whole logistics organization of creating a great experience, I suddenly realized how intrusive it would be if the guest actually saw what you were doing. So I created what was called the Abercrombie and Kent Cocoon. And what I told everybody, had to be a military operation on the outside. The clients would be cocooned in the ANK cocoon. So all this stuff can happen outside to make sure that everybody's safe, everybody's well fed, the best guys, but make it effortless. Make it so easy as if it's so natural that you don't ruin the experience. Celebrating their 48th year of operation, Abercrombie and Kent's commitment to excellence remains unrivaled offering their clients 350 tours in over 100 countries across seven continents. Like Jeffrey Kent, the employees of Abercrombie and Kent share in the passion of offering first-class comforts, style, and luxury in some of the most remote destinations on the planet. What I've been able to do is form a team. And I have to say, Abercrombie and Kent is not at all about me. Abercrombie and Kent is about all those wonderful people who work all across the globe for Abercrombie and Kent, who live it, dream it, they're passionate, they love the business, they understand it, they love its history, its heritage, and they will go the extra mile every single day to make sure that everybody's happy and they go back saying, you know, that was just the most amazing adventure I've ever had. People are just about I, and I'm all about we. We Abercrombie and Kent made this business. Our essence are the people who work for Abercrombie and Kent and that's what I guess taste every day. It's what they actually taste when they get to this amazing destination and have that experience which is delivered by executive teams and by our professional guides. Here we've got an elephant over here, okay? That's its back foot on top of its front foot over there. That's buffalo over there, and this is all within the last 24 hours. This is a hippopotamus over here. Okay, so there you've got a big hippo track. 
so guys please don't think I need just quickly need to go and edit something or let me go and check on the camera crew or something like that because between six and seven there can be lions between one and two there can be a leopard or a herd of buffaloes or anything like that so if you want to go somewhere particularly when we drop you off at, at your rooms if you say okay please come back and pick me up in 10 minutes time yeah, or in 15 minutes time we'll come back and we'll pick you up a hundred times in a night if you want to rather that than you try and walk by yourselves okay please this place is wild 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 Recognizing his responsibility to the communities around him, Jeffrey Kent embraced the notion of giving something in return to the very people who left their fingerprints on Kent's experiences throughout his lifetime. Most importantly, he has fostered a sense of ownership in the lives he has touched. I formed this company in 1962, so I've been doing it a long time. And every sort of two or three years, you say to yourself, well, what's the next adventure? You know, can it get any better? And every year, it gets better. What I want to do now is, again, just the same. I want to expose people to these wonderful adventures, but I want to build wonderful lodges like we're in today in every one of these areas and teach people all the time about the communities, about the environment. <laughs> Out of this evolved this relationship between a business, myself, my responsibility towards the local peoples who were there, and really what you call today philanthropy. It was early philanthropy, but not without a business plan. It wasn't written down in Washington or in London. It was written, it was worked out as an entrepreneur sitting in Africa with the wind, like today, wind blowing through your hair with some elephants watching and a lion killing over there, and it would be interspersed with that. But that's how it evolved. It wasn't something, it was just decency of what you should do for local people. From those early days of philanthropy, this has evolved to today's Abercrombie Kent philanthropy. And really, wherever we go and whatever we do, we must move in parallel with Abercrombie Kent philanthropy. So the business side must move in parallel. We will not build a lodge without first hearing what A and K philanthropy is going to do. And this and this revolves basically around education, around the environment, around conservation and around health. It is vital more than ever today that Abercrombie Kent philanthropy takes a huge role. And that's not just giving away money. And that, that's, that's, that's the least thing you should do, actually. If you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. And if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. What we want to do is work with the communities and through our lodges, create jobs, teach them we offer them these changes. For instance, uh, Simonga village, you know, we built a well, but it's up to them to support the world. We built a health clinic, which they have to run and support, and we will help them do that. But it's all about teaching them to help themselves and to advance themselves. Africa needs a helping hand rather than a handout. Among the many global efforts of Abercrombie and Kent philanthropy is the recent installation of a medical facility and a borehole which provides fresh water for the people of Samanga village. Situated just inside the Mishoa Tunya National Park, it is the children of this village who retrieve water from sources sometimes miles from their village. 
The responsibility of bringing fresh water to their families precludes these children from receiving an education as their days are filled with carrying water buckets that sometimes weigh as much as they do. Next to water, medical attention is one of the most critical necessities for survival. When illness is present in harder to reach areas such as Samanga Village, the absence of immediate medical attention can result in the spread of disease, rendering a village in serious danger of being wiped out. Thanks to the efforts of Abercrombie & Kent Philanthropy, Samanga Village has a local water supply and immediate medical attention for the villagers living there. Children have the opportunity to spend their days in school preparing themselves for a better tomorrow. Jeffrey Kent's pursuits have been a living, breathing reminder that success is defined as having fully lived. Failure can be regarded as never having tried. You have to be brave. Take that first step. Live your dream, share this passion, and bring the people and change their lives, because that's really important. Try, try, try again, and be fearless. Once you've pressed the green button, the go button, you go for it. You must never give up. Believe in your passion.
passion and keep on doing it. people who dream and people who live their dreams. We encourage you to dare, dream, do.